Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a warm welcome to today's event, a career in rubber industry. I'm Rufred, your host for today. Today's event brings together representatives from various parts of Singapore's rubber industry to share about their careers as well as the opportunities available. It is jointly organized by International Enterprise Singapore, also known as IE Singapore, Rubber Trade Association of Singapore, RTAS, International Rubber Study Group, IRSG, as well as NTU Center of Excellence International Trading, CEIT. The event is also conceived under the 100th anniversary of Rubber Trade Association of Singapore. To kick off this evening program, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Leong Ting Fook from RTAS to deliver the opening remarks. Mr. Leong, please. Thank you. Don't worry, these are not my lecture notes and these are not the books that I depend on to lecture to you. Very good evening to all of you. I'm given the job by RTAS, you heard RTAS, the Rubber Trade Association of Singapore, to uh, probably introduce five, for, five, for the next five minutes something about uh, the association and uh, probably a little bit of history. I know history is uh, quite boring, but I hope the, during the five minutes, I'm going to inspire you with the history of some of the pioneers in the rubber industry, the successful people in the industry. And uh, at the end of five minutes, uh, I hope you aspire to be one of the tycoons that I refer to. First of all, uh, I'm a director of uh, Southland Global Private Limited, which is uh, also a member of the Rubber Trade Association of Singapore, uh, RATS. And, uh, and uh, we are one of the 49 members in the association. So the, uh, the uh, association, I can say not in a shy way, it's quite exclusive uh, association. Many of the members, many, many of the corporate members, many of the uh, leaders of the uh, organizations are by themselves billionaires, millionaires. So in a way, uh, it is quite an exclusive uh, association. And... Uh, <clears throat> Many of, the, many of the members, we trade in billions of dollars a year and um, many of them are, of course, uh, having assets of uh, individually uh, millions of dollars themselves. So uh, just this month, March, we celebrated the 100th year of the association. The association was uh, started, founded in uh, 18, 18, uh, 1918, sorry. And uh, this year, in March, we just celebrated the uh, centenary. Uh, we had our celebrations and uh, a, thousand, a thousand guests were invited to the uh, celebration. And uh, in starting from uh, 1911, the association was started by a group of uh, pioneers, rubber pioneers. Rubber became very popular in the 1910s, 1920s, when uh, motor cars were popularized, especially when the Ford T model was, uh, was mass-produced in uh, 1901. The uh, demand for tires, the demand for tires leading to the demand for rubber was great. And uh, a lot of the uh, pioneers in Singapore, the rubber pioneers, started to plant, started to, to, to have rubber trees plantations and to trade and become merchants in, uh, in, uh, in rubber. <clears throat> so 
before, even before the Second World War, you heard of, you, you know of places like Sambawang, Chongpang, Misun, Bukit Timah. These were, these were very uh, established rubber plantation areas. They, uh, they were named after, many, many of the areas were named after the uh, pine, uh, rubber pioneers. For example, Yisun is named after Lim Ni Sun, and uh, Chongpang is named after his son, Lim Chongpang. Then we have got uh, many, many places in Singapore, many buildings, many roads, named after the uh, rubber industry pioneers and, uh, and uh, leaders. Examples are uh, Che Yan Street, you have heard of Che Yan Street. It's named after Tan Che Yan, one of the first rubber plantation uh, owners. Uh, he started planting rubber in the 1910s. Tan Che Yan is also the grandson of uh, Tan Tok Sing, Tan Tok Sing fame, Tan Tok Sing uh, hospital fame. Then we have got uh, Buntik. You know the Buntik area, Buntik estate, Buntik rubber, uh, uh, housing estates. It's named after Dr. Lim Buntik, one of the pioneers of, uh, of uh, planting rubber also. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, of course, the very famous is uh, uh, Li Kong Chen, Li Rubber. Li Rubber today is one of the oldest member of the association. Li Rubber was started in 1931. And uh, up to today, they are still very active, trading, processing, exporting rubber from headquarters from the headquarters in Singapore. So during the early days, the driving forces were the pioneers for the rubber, what they call the global rubber era at that time, even before the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, and uh, especially during the 1970s, the pioneers and the, the present generation of uh, rubber traders, rubber processors, rubber tycoons, supported by the government and working with the government, <coughs> continue to propel Singapore as a rubber centre. And today, Singapore is the international center for price setting. In other words, the whole world looks at Singapore, the, the, the rubber pricing in Singapore, to, to mark their contracts, to, to, to price their contracts, or to make long-term uh, agreements on uh, the delivery of uh, rubber. And uh, of course, uh, this uh, university, the Nanyang U University, now of course it's called NTU, was very closely associated with uh, Mr. Tan Lak Sai. Tan Lak Sai in uh, 1953, he, he was very prosperous at that time, started to, uh, to uh, gather funds to, 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 fund, to fund the uh, univers university, starting from 1953. And today, I think uh, his legacy stays with, I think, there is the uh, Tan, Lak Sai, uh, Tan Lak Sai professorship in uh, NTU. The other big name is, of course, uh, Tan Kah Kee. Tan Kah Kee is a, 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 a legend. This uh, legendary uh, Tan Kah Kee was a businessman. He started rubber in the 1910s became very rich and became very well known in both in Singapore, Southeast Asia, as well as in, in China. And I think there is also the uh, Tan Kah Kee, Tan Kah Kee uh, NTU NIE scholarship. Now, uh, apart from the Chinese who formed, the, who started the rubber association, the rubber trade association, there is also the non-Chinese, and the most famous of all is uh, Henry Ridley. He was the first uh, director of the Botanic Gardens in Singapore from, for 23 years. 
1988 to 1911. He concentrated, he focused, and he spent a lot of time promoting the plantations of, uh, plantation of rubber, both in Singapore, Mal Malaysia, Malaya at that time, and uh, throughout Saudi Southeast Asia. His research and uh, contributions to the rubber trade made him to be called or uh, to be uh, respected as the father of the rubber industry. Now, uh, there could be another 50 to 100 other corporations doing rubber. They may not be in the Rubber Trade Association of Singapore yet, or they could be members of another association going by uh, six letters, S-I-C-C-R-A, Singapore International Chamber of Commerce Rubber Association. That association, the membership comprises uh, mostly of uh, tyre manufacturers, Western uh, traders, Western rubber merchants. So the two organisations, the two associations, kind of uh, uh, exist side by side in Singapore. <clears throat> so I hope uh, with me giving all the names, so many names, you'll be inspired that pro probably some time to come, many of you will aspire to be tycoons. Maybe rubber trade is one of those channels where you, you can make yourself, make yourself rich. So, uh, let, let, uh, let me wish you uh, the best in that direction. And if you want to know, know more about the, the, the success, the careers of the pioneers that I mentioned, there are two books. Uh, one commissioned by the Rubber Trade Association in 2014. This book is called, uh, is, is uh, named Singapore Rubber Trade and Economic Heritage. This book was written by Peter Tan. He's still a very active uh, veteran in the trade. And, um, and uh, inside here, he described many of the people uh, who had been successful. And uh, you, can read the, you can read the track records of uh, the people here. And this month, to celebrate the centenary of the, the association, the uh, Rubber Trade Association, printed this book, 100 years of uh, RTAS, 1918 to 2018. So these two books will be presented to uh, uh, Miss Lee, the director, and uh, I hope uh, this will be a, a resource for many, many of you who are interested in the rubber trade. Thank you very much. Thank you for the sharing, Mr. Leong. We shall now proceed with the panel discussion. Mr. Leong will be our first panelist. He will also be re representing Southland Rubber Group, where he holds the appointment of director. At the same time, I would also like to invite the other panelists forward. We have Mr. Guo Jianfeng, economist and statistician of IRSG. Mr. Sandana Das, CEO of R1 International. Ms. Werni Drama, Director of Wilson Global Trade. Mr. Jeffrey Schneider, Associate Director of Goodyear. May I now invite the panel moderator on stage, please. Today's panel will be moderated by Mr. Tan T. Yong. Vice President of Commodities at Singapore Exchange, SGX. I'll now hand the time over to T. Yong. Hello, good evening to all. Uh, my name is Ti Yong, I work for Singapore Exchange um, and um, I haven't been associated with rubber for uh, too many years but in the short history that I've been associated with this industry 
what I've come to realize is uh, the importance of uh, this industry uh, in terms of its heritage as well as its economic contribution that it has had uh, with Singapore uh, over the past 100 years or more. All right. So I often tell people this. Um, before there is um, derivatives trading in Singapore, there is equities trading. And before there is equities trading in Singapore, there is uh, rubber trading. So that gives you, a, I suppose, a brief idea of how established and entrenched rubber trading is in Singapore. Right. So, so, so now I, I try and put uh, myself in your shoes. Um, coming to this event, I imagine you want to go away with uh, answers to three questions. First, what really is the rubber industry? Right? Uh, how does it work? Um, um, secondly, of course, what are the career roles and what are the opportunities uh, in the rubber industry? Third, I suppose, uh, third is something that Mr. Leong has touched on, um, um, but I suppose um, more currently, uh, what can a young graduate uh, expect to be paid right, after you graduate? Right? So I suppose... Um, Today, the organizers have put together a, a, a very strong team of people who, who, who can very well uh, help to understand the first two questions, and of course, the third one. I, I will try in the next one hour or so to induce conversations so that they will answer all three questions. I'm not so conf confident about the third one. Uh, if you want to know more about the salaries, feel free to stay on after the event and uh, talk to them in private. I'm sure you'll milk more information out. Right. Okay. Um. I. I. I suppose let's keep this informal. We are all in uh, jackets and suit, but it really means nothing. Right. I pre much prefer shorts and and and, and t-shirts. Right. Um. So. 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 So we we will get this going in an informal way. Um. We we have. We have staged this to some extent, right? So I've asked, I've put some questions to them, uh, and I hopefully they've come prepared with some answers, right? Um, so, so, so I will, I will, I will, I will do the round of questions, uh, and and thereafter we can open the floor for Q and A. But at any point in time, please don't uh, let us stop you. Uh, feel free to ask ask question, all okay? right? So I suppose let me just turn back to Mr. Leong, Mr. Leong. Uh, veteran in this industry. Um, I suppose you've given a good overview of the rubber industry, but um, I don't know if everybody here knows uh, how, what is really rubber, right? How is it produced? Uh, what is it used for? Um, and, and really, what is the relevance of Singapore to the rubber trading industry, given that rubber is neither produced nor consumed uh, in Singapore today? Right, uh, and I've also got the, maybe let's start with these two questions. I've got a third one that uh, I'll probably ask you after these two. Yeah, you know, you know that I don't have good memory, so <laughs> one question at a time. I think the first question is about uh, rubber. What no, it, yeah. <laughs> it can't be on any other commodity, so, right? So Mr. Leong is, 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 uh, is, uh, is from a big uh, rubber producing company. Uh, my question really is, how is rubber produced and what is it used for? Yeah, many people ask me what is rubber. My standard answer is rubber is money. When you go to a rubber factory, you smell money. <laughs> so that is my standard uh, reply. Uh, but seriously, uh, rubber, you know, is from the trees, but uh, I'm not going to dwell too much as to how, how you get the rubber tap and all that, but uh, I will give you an overview. When I, started, when I started 40 years ago, in 1978, in the rubber business, the world production was 3.75 metric tons of uh, rubber. And last year, the IRSG came out with the estimate that uh, there were 11.4 11 million met metric tons of rubber produced. You know, one, one container load, you see the 20-foot containers on the road, huh? it's about 20, 20 tons of rubber. 
So you can imagine, last year there were 700,000 uh, 700 units, uh, 20 foot equivalent units of rubber being produced and moved around the world. So you can see that uh, from 3.75 to 11.4 million metric tons, the, the quantity of rubber produced and consumed at the same time has gone up by 3.5 times, or if you want a bigger figure, 350%. So the industry is growing and um, it's uh, vibrant. And uh, on, the, on the producing side, we have got probably the IRSG listed about uh, 35, 50 countries, 35 to 50 countries producing rubber. But the, the top six uh, countries produces about 85% of the world rubber. You have got Thailand producing about 36% uh, of the total. Indonesia about 25%. Vietnam about 7 or 8%. And then you have got Malaysia, uh, Malaysia and, and the rest about 5%. And the majority of all the countries are producing less than 1%. So it is quite concentrated uh, in terms of the countries producing rubber. It's all around Southeast Asia. Then on the consumer, consumer side, China from, from this century onwards had been, um, had been, had been uh, growing in leaps and bounds in their in the consumption. The number of vehicles, the, 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 uh, the, the rubber products produced in, in China had been growing tremendously fast. And uh, today, they are consuming about 40%. According to IRSG, it's about 39% of the total consumption of natural rubber. And uh, the other countries will be like India coming up fast, Japan, Malaysia and, and, uh, and Thailand, they have got their own in industries. So the other, uh, probably, uh, apart from the top six, the other countries, the other maybe 30, 40, 50 countries are producing less than 1% each uh, towards the uh, total, total production of uh, rubber. As to what the rubber is used for, Rubber can, can be used for huge items. There could be about 10,000 items that, that, that could be made from uh, natural rubber. You have got big items like the big mining, mining uh, machinery tires, huge ones, to the, uh, the uh, vib vibration anti-earthquake blocks uh, that are used in uh, uh, earthquake-prone countries to, for the foundation of their buildings. Those are very huge items. To the very small one, many of you are, uh, many of you are using the, the, the PC here, the computer. You know the, the, uh, the key, the, the, uh, the key that you're using? There could be a small rubber spring to help you to, to, to uh, provide the spring to your, your keyboard. So those are the small items. Of course, there are items like, apart from tires, which consume about 70% of the rubber produced. We have got hoses, we have got conveyor belts, we have got uh, escalator railings, shoes, carpet bays, many, many items. And uh, it could be up to 10,000 items, big or small, that is uh, made from uh, rubber. Have I, uh, covered, have I covered <laughs> your first question? <laughs> Yes, uh, actually, um, very comprehensively so. So, so I suppose, um, um, so, so we know rubber is a agricultural product uh, on the one end, and when it's being processed uh, and, uh, and transformed, it becomes more of an industrial product. It's a hybrid commodity, uh, really unusual, because in, in the other agricultural commodities, it's either agriculture, 
and you consume uh, um, as food, or um, it is typically a industry com in industrial commodity like oil or metals, and, and then you, it, it remains as an industrial commodity. So rubber is really unique uh, in this area. Right? So um, now, now, now that we know what the rubber industry is about, maybe I can uh, just get your help again to, to, to probably just uh, elaborate on some of the career roles that's available in the rubber industry. Okay, the total industry, you have got upstream to downstream. Upstream will be the plantation. Huh? We don't talk about plantation because in Singapore, you got no more plantations. And uh, I was uh, quite amazed to find a few trees. You know, one day I was uh, uh, doing the Henderson wave walk. And along the way, there were some, some overhanging branches. And I look up and it was uh, the branches from some wild rubber trees growing along the, uh, the forest, you know, crossing the, the wave. So there are a few. Even in the botanic gardens, I think at one time, the, the rubber, rubber association or the SECRA, I don't know which one, donated 10 trees to be, to be kept as legacy trees in, uh, in the bot botanic gardens. But now I think they are, they are gone. Maybe one or two left. So... Um, they're still there? Oh, I. <laughs> oh, they have shifted to Garden by the Bay. Oh, I'm a bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit out of date. So. So the question is to what are the what are the openings uh, in the industry? We don't talk about don't talk about the upstream the plantations, neither do we talk about the industries. My company has got uh, probably uh, 36 factories around, around the world. And uh, we have got many jobs opening, but uh, we normally uh, send our people off to, to places like Vietnam, Myanmar, and uh, in time to come, Africa for exposure. So people joining our company will have got openings like this if they, if they care to learn about rubber processing. But right now in Singapore, Singapore is a distribute, uh, we, we have got distribution uh, functions in, in Singapore. So our company has got what we call front, front office, middle office, back office. The front office are the people who handle the trade, the, the, uh, face the market. They face the customer, they, they, they face the suppliers, they, they buy and they, they sell. Those are the front, front line uh, positions. In the middle office, we have got support for logistics, for research, for uh, all the other backups. So in the, at the back will be the uh, accounting and the finance uh, staff, banking staff and so on. So the openings are, are lined up in, uh, in much the same way for most of uh, the distributing or marketing companies in Singapore. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leong. Um, okay, so now you know um, the operations and probably the career opportunities within a rubber producer. And given that rubber is produced in uh, various parts of Southeast Asia and even as far as South Africa, uh, West Africa, right? West Africa. Um, right, West Africa. Um, you know that joining a rubber producer will give you a chance for rotation to these emerging markets, uh, and they can be quite exciting. Okay. Um, now, let me turn my attention to Mr. Das. Mr. Das. <laughs> Mr. Das has been very kind. He just arrived today, uh, rushed from the airport, and didn't sleep a wink last night. Uh, so, so, okay. So Mr. Das works for a trading company, one of the biggest uh, rubber trading company uh, in Singapore. So what we would like to learn from him is uh, probably, can you explain to us the trade flow of rubber? Uh, where do you buy your rubber from and where do you send it to? What is the role of a trading house? And I suppose most importantly, how do you make money? What is your business model? <laughs> uh. 
Sorry, uh, good evening. Uh, real pleasure to be here. You know, I was uh, just thinking, looking back decades ago, when I was in the uni, I always tried to find every reason to stay away from the lecture rooms. <laughs> but, you know, nowadays, whenever I pass by the university, I wish I was a student again. So, believe me, these are the best years of your life. Enjoy it and make the maximum use of it. The, I mean, I represent a global rubber trading company. We are pure rubber traders. So, uh, in that sense, we source our rubber from various countries. Uh, in fact, we have uh, 10 offices in different countries, and we source like from, from 12 different countries, rubber from 12 different countries. And uh, we then find a way to sell this rubber to consumers all over the world. So as a pure trading company, we are standing between the processor, the producer, the supplier, and the consumers. So this is the basic uh, role of a trading company. In, in our case, a pure trading company has to buy from the processor supplier when there is no other when, when a consumer doesn't buy. That means to say we need to always provide a market either to buy or to sell. We have to do both, whatever is demanded. So what is the, uh, what is the uh, competence or what is the secret of a pure trading company? There's only one main one, which is that they are price risk managers. I think that this is a very interesting point. And if anybody is interested to be a trader, the only reason can be because of the ability to take on risk, to manage risk, and to make a financial success of that risk taking. So that is what a trading company's main activity, competency, and model is. Good. Um, so what makes a good trader? Sorry, Mr. Das, still on you. <laughs> oh. What makes a good trader? What are the skill sets? And typically, how many years of training is required before a trader can make independent decisions? I've been trading for more than 40 years. And I can say very safely, I've never found trading as work. I never came to office as work, I never found any, any day same as the other. And that, that's the excitement about trading and being a trader. What, what are the essential qualities of a trader? To me, a trader basically, he, he, he has to be like a businessman. And if you want, to, I mean, he's a businessman in the sense that he is, doesn't put his own capital but he does business and enjoys the rewards of his success. So one of the key things to be a good trader is, what is your motivation? Why, why do you want to become a trader? Why do you want to take out this job? I think the motivation is number one. Number two, I think that he has to have good business sense. He has to have good discipline. And uh, the market being such, I think uh, Mr. Leong already mentioned, the uh, global trade runs in billions of dollars. Each trade can be a few million dollars. You cannot afford to make mistakes. So you must be a very detailed person, somebody who's, who is well-versed in, uh, in numbers, well-versed in, uh, in making sense, money sense. The other one is, if you want to be a good trader, you need to be curious because you can never stop learning. Every day is different. The factors that affect the rubber price movement varies a lot. 
Actually, a good trader is, you know, he has to know about the world economics, he has to know about the world uh, politics, he has to know about the world currencies, he has to know about shipping, he has to know about weather, he's got to know about the consumption patterns, supply and demand, how competitors operate, a wide range of skills. That's why a, a rubber trader's job, to me, is the most exciting job. As I say, it's not a job. The most exciting uh, hobby. hobby or fun. <laughs> fun that you can have. Because it's so, you know, you cover the whole range of, of economics and international trade, international politics, philosophy, psychology, the whole lot of it. So, you, you need to be very curious because you've got to learn every day. Finally, I think you also need to have good attitude because you have to work in team. You've got to, got to earn the trust of the people you're buying the rubber from. You've got to earn the trust of the people you are selling to. Because in, unless you can create a, a trust and a good relationship, it's very difficult for you to do business. Thank you, Mr. Das. You Thank you. Huh? Sorry? Yeah, and one more. Um, one. If you don't mind, uh, what do you think is the growth prospect of the industry? Okay, this one, you know, I, I, I'd be very honest with you. The rubber industry is a very mature industry. There is a lot of consolidations happening in the industry. As you heard, it's more than 100 years old, the industry. So you can, you can understand that a mature industry doesn't provide a lot of job opportunities or growth. And, and that's a fact. But having said that, you know, I think that you all must be excited that there are opportunities in the rubber industry. Why do I say that? Number one, you find that there are people, people who are in the rubber industry are, I mean, you don't find people who are young in the rubber industry. Many of them are past their 50s. And a lot of them, the, the best ones are in the 60s, some even 85, still actively trading. So what that shows is that these people have to be replaced <laughs> at some point or other. So there will be a certain need for a huge number of good rubber traders. And that's why I think that you know, the, 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 the international enterprise and your university is trying to, 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 to show you that there are possibilities in the rubber industry. The one more thing is that, you know, I think that the rubber industry being old and mature is not a sexy or uh, exciting industry because it didn't change very much. But they cannot continue to remain status quo like this because their, their old system was looking at fundamental supply demand. Nowadays, the commodity industry is going through very big changes. We are talking about algorithms, we are talking about analytics, we are talking of AI, and these are all very, very foreign to all the existing rubber people, you know? So you have a good chance with all your new knowledge to enter the industry and in fact reinvent the industry. So from that point of view, for young people with the right uh, expertise, there's plenty of scope. Thank you, Mr. Das. So from that short presentation, I suppose I gather two things, all right? Uh, one, while rubber is not a very sexy industry in most people's eyes, because it has been around for a while now, um, uh, it is, an industry that is in need of rejuvenation and therefore uh, opportunities for uh, the younger generation. And two, um, um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are many areas that uh, will require changes, changes, improvements, and therefore uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you to make a mark in, uh, in, 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 in reinventing some of the uh, in industry and making the industry a more advanced one, I suppose, right? Okay. So now, can I uh, get uh, Jeffrey sure. to share with us some of his thoughts 
Um, so rubber is not consumed and is not produced in Singapore. I say that again. So why is Goodyear, which is a very global uh, brand for tyres, um, uh, why, why do you choose to base your global pro procurement office in Singapore? Uh, and can you describe the role of a procurement office? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I, uh, first thing first, I'm not 85. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I promise you, I've lost a lot of my hair, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, still, uh, I'm still on the good side of 40, so there are some young people uh, in, the, uh, in the industry, uh, in including uh, about 98% of our office. So, um, Doss, I, I have to disagree with you there. So, um, <laughs> And then just one other thing, yeah, no, I know, I know. But one other thing too is, uh, you know, when, 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 when Tim, you go to a rubber factory, you smell, you smell, you smell money. I smell cost. <laughs> when I go to a tire factory and I smell a vulcanization of rubber, which smells just as bad as processing rubber, I smell money. So Goodyear calls the, we call the tire factory the smell, we call it the smell of money, just like you guys would refer to the processing as the smell of money. Um, but uh, why are we here? It's a, uh, it, it's a good question. Um, and uh, we've actually been here 101 years, right? So uh, this, this past year, we celebrated uh, 100 years. Um, so we, we've been in Singapore since uh, 19, uh, 1917. And uh, you know, we came here for a lot of the same reasons that Tim explained earlier, um, as the rubber trade grew in this, in this area. Um, so Goodyear was the first of the tire majors to, uh, to set up shop here in, in, uh, in Singapore. Um, and then the, you know, the, the main reason we're here um, is uh, all of our friends are here, right? There's a, a number of uh, uh, the trading firms in the, uh, in the audience tonight, and there's a number of producers. Uh, um, but essentially, the entire industry you know, sits here uh, within, within Singapore, right? So. Um, all of my competitors in the tire industry, we are all here in Singapore, um, all the top 10. Uh, we all have offices. Uh, we all have um, roughly, uh, you know, the big three, big four have roughly 40, 50 people that, that just take care of the rubber trade. So there's a, a, a number of jobs in, in, in that function. Uh, but essentially the rubber, the rubber is here because it's a rubber community. Um, and this is where the rubber is priced, it's where it's sold, it's where it's bought. Um, and it's where all of, the, uh, all of the action takes place, right? So um, Goodyear, uh, they, they sent me here over, to, over two years ago um, because uh, we want to be in the middle of the action and we want to be in the middle of, of where rubber takes place. Um, so that is, that is essentially why we're here. It's a, it's, a, it's a very simple reason. It's where rubber, rubber is headquartered in the world, right? Everybody who's anybody in rubber is in Singapore, right? So. If it's an industry you're interested in, you're in the right place. Um, so the second question, uh, you know, what is it like on, on our side, right? Um, you know, so you know, we, we view traders a little differently than traders might view themselves. Um, but uh, you know, from our side, what it's like to be in the procurement side is uh, I view traders as somebody who can bring value to uh, to my needs, right? I could. I could probably care less about your positions and your financial risks and, and everything else. What I ask you to do for me is to bring me value and provide, uh, provide access you know, to the rubber factories out in, in the world, right? And, and that's, uh, that's what we look for from a procurement side, is we, we have 52 factories around the world, uh, which our team here in Singapore buys all the rubber, uh, runs all the quality, does all the shipping logistics and uh, the finance side. And uh, from that, we have to procure um, about 500,000 to a million dollars worth of rubber every single day uh, from these guys uh, and other folks here in Singapore. And we have to ship it all around the world, right? So that is our core, that's our core responsibility from a, a major tire man manufacturer's rubber team here is, uh, you know, build relationships with the traders, uh, the producers, and then figure out how do we get enough rubber so we can build the tires so when people go to the tire shop, our tire is there. That is quite scary. Um. <laughs> There's always something under construction in Singapore. <laughs> so other, anything else I can expand on in that, in that, that field or? 
So within Goodyear, um, apart from being a procurement officer, do you get rotated to other parts of the business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, you know, my career has spanned many, many parts of uh, of the uh, you know of, of the business that that we have. Uh, I've spent time at a uh, at a tire factory. I've spent time in the uh, the engineering field. Um, so this is just one of the uh, one of the rotations that I've taken as as being a part of a major global manufacturing company uh, in the procurement field. And we do the same for our associates here in Singapore. We we just don't have rubber procurement here. We have a team of 130 people here in Singapore, and we rotate throughout those positions as well. So, rubber is a great job to have within Goodyear. Obviously, it's in the name, uh, but from a standpoint of uh, rotations and other opportunities, we have they're very plentiful at all the tire manufacturers. So I'm just waiting for a minute. Hopefully, this will stop. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Right. So now we turn to Wernie. Wernie also works for a trading company. Um, as you can well observe, she's the only lady on the panel. And I'm going to ask her some questions relating uh, to that front. Right. So um, are there many women traders in the rubber industry? Uh, I suppose, what is a typical day for you? Uh, what coverage is required in a job? How often do you travel? Um, and how do you juggle between your family and your work commitments? Many questions, sorry. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Bernie. Thank you for having me here. Um, as he mentioned before, I think um, I'm going to share uh, about, uh, about myself as a trader in the rubber industry. Basically, there are very little women that's doing, uh, that's doing this trading job in the rubber industry. I think it's because of the nature of the business. And as uh, Mr. Das mentioned, that um, as a trader, you need to take risks. So women usually are more conservative and do not take risks, okay? okay. Actually, uh, my typical day will actually evolve around work and my family because I have two um, young, um, so-called, not so young kids, but I still need to look at them. One is in primary five and one is in sec one. So typically my day will be like about 6.30. I need to get up and to try to catch them before they leave for school and try to squeeze in some me time to do some workout before the market open because the future market actually open at from 7.45 to nine o'clock and it doesn't close until six o'clock. So the whole day, you just need to monitor the market, but the excitement, the physical excitement where all the Goodyear or whatever, the big five, the tire consumer will come in is actually after China market close, which is after three. So three to six will be where the excitement coming in. So as what uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Das say, trading rubber is not a work, it become a passion, a hobby that you must you go to work every day and expect that something different will happen. So it's quite an exciting day, every day. Yeah. Um, so, um, what is the, the other question, sorry? Um, I suppose, um, so how do you juggle between your, your family and your work commitment? Okay, for me, I think I'm rather fortunate because um, I have quite a supportive husband and like I have, I managed to remote control manage my children. <laughs> you know, remote control, like I will text them like, oh, uh, uh, I have a lot of CCTV in my apartment. So you know what, like I'm trading, like I can see them from real estate. Like, hey, are you doing your work? And I will text them, something like that. Yeah, but seriously, <laughs> because they are, they are older now, so like it's easier to go by, but because also, I think it's because I have family support and I have like um, people helping me around. So when I do need to travel, I don't really travel too often, maybe about six times a year um, to go to, mainly I cover China because being a trader, I think in a company, you cover different parts of the market. For me, I cover uh, China uh, because I can speak Mandarin I'm, and actually I'm, I can speak I'm a trilingual, I can speak Bahasa, Indonesia, I speak English, I speak Mandarin, so it's actually kind of helpful in the business because 
um, some, most of the rub, uh, some of the rubber is actually produced is in Indonesia and Malaysia and Thailand. So, uh, and the biggest buyer now is China. So being able to speak the language actually can get you going there and to know your customer better. Yeah. So I will travel maybe like this Saturday, I'll be going to China to attend a seminar. I'll spend about a week and uh, coming back again just before the SA1 for my kids exam and I need to monitor them already. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I do notice a number of uh, young ladies in the room. And uh, when it did say that ladies are, uh, are not good at taking risks, actually that's not true. Uh, I think that when we talk about risk, very often, you know, it's not like to be a hero, you know, you just, just blindly take a risk and hope for the best. I think a risk always is a very uh, considered decision when you make judgments, taking into account all possibilities, and including what's your fallback, what's your cut loss. So from that point of view, I think, personally, I think that ladies would make very good traders. They would, provided they have passion for the job, because the job is a, a, a demanding job. Uh, you did answer about the work-life balance. Uh, in rubber trading, there is no such thing as Balance. It's all fun. <laughs> it's not work. <laughs> it's not life. It's all fun. So some of the ladies who are suited for that can be very, very good traders. I, I, I really think so. But in, our, in the past, often we don't find, for some reason or other, ladies applying to be a trader. It is, but if they do, I would personally think that they would make good traders if they had the other traits the other, other characteristics required to be a good trader. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Das. That is, um, I suppose, my, uh, my personal observation as well. Girls tend to be disciplined <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, managing positions, uh, at least in my previous experience with a trading company. So, so yes, ladies, please join the industry. We are in shortage. <laughs> right. um, so, Tian Feng, uh, our last panelist, he works for IRSG uh, in the role of a researcher. Right? So, um, can you help our audience understand um, how is research and analysts uh, relevant in rubber trading? Uh, how do traders make use of those information to trade the market? And what are the statistics and uh, trends that you look out for to understand the market? Okay. Uh, before <coughs> answering your question, let me give you a brief introduction of the organization that I work for. Uh, the International Rubber Study Group is an autonomous uh, intergovernmental commodity organization uh, serving the global rubber industry. So we collect, uh, analyze, and uh, publish uh, the data pertaining to the entire rubber value chain. So like what uh, <coughs> Mr. Leon just uh, mentioned, uh, those data are from our publications. And also we serve as the uh, global platform for uh, the market participants to uh, meet and uh, discuss the issues uh, relating or affecting the development of the rubber industry. And uh, yeah, that's uh, roughly about the organization. And uh, to answer your first question, uh, how does the research come into uh, play for uh, the trading business. So to answer that question, we have to first understand that uh, the long-term market trend of any commodity uh, is driven by the demand and supply fundamentals. So neither market speculation nor uh, government intervention could distort the market price in the long run. So that's uh, the essential reason why we need research uh, when making trading uh, decisions. And we study the uh, fundamentals by working on the demand and supply uh, balance sheet, which uh, include the global production, consumption, uh, trade activities, and also uh, the stock levels. Then from there, you can get the uh, level of uh, deficit or surplus for the global rubber industry for uh, a particular year. And, but knowing the absolute number of the deficit and, uh, 
or surplus isn't good enough to make uh, investment decisions. What really matters is uh, what the market think the gap is going to be and what we think the, market, uh, the gap is going to be. So, for example, let's um, assume uh, for the global natural rubber market uh, in 2018, it is going to be a, a surplus of 100,000 tons. This is uh, what the market expected. But from our study, uh, I'm assuming, not, not reviewing any of our data. So uh, if we get the results of a uh, uh, surplus of 200,000 metric tons, that's uh, 100,000 metric, ton, 100, metric ton difference uh, uh, apart from the market expectations. So that's, that is going to uh, drive the price further down from the uh, current level. So that's how the research results could help in uh, making trading decisions. Yeah. And what's your second question? I so what are the career opportunities for a rubber research analyst in Singapore or in the regional countries? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I not uh, I, I only work in the industry for like less than five years. So uh, my experience is uh, just my uh, my opinions is based on my experience. So there are two um, options. One is to keep on the uh, stay on the research track and uh, you could become a world-class veteran uh, researcher in the rubber industry. Uh, I know a few people who, has, uh, who have been working as rubber economists or rubber researcher for several decades, and even in their 80s. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, from what I know, uh, Mr. Das, when you joined the rubber industry 45 years ago, you start as a rubber scholar, is it? Yeah, so you can see where that path could lead you to. And uh, also you have the opportunity to uh, switch to an uh, advisory role uh, for mergers and acquisitions because there are a lot of consolidations going on currently in the rubber industry. So people with uh, research background and uh, extensive knowledge for, for the international market uh, could be very valuable to uh, those corporate actions. Then the second option is to switch back to the trading role. Uh, because from what I see, these two uh, jobs, are, uh, the skill sets are somehow uh, inter-transferable. So the research background equip the person with uh, extensive industrial knowledge and uh, a wide networks uh, with different stakeholders in the value chain. So uh, these skills could help the person uh, do better when he uh, decided to become a trader. Yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. Um, very comprehensive. So I suppose my understanding is this. To be a good trader, um, even before you take a position, you need to be able to form a view. And in order for you to form a view, you need to be able to, 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 be able to conduct some form of research uh, to, to, to lead to that view. And therefore, um, a good trader, I imagine, it's always a good researcher, plus a few other attributes, All right? Um, so with that, um, I would like to throw open the floor. Uh, I would like to throw the floor open to uh, questions, and um, and feel free shout out, or or if you need a mic, we I'm sure we'll get some help. Um, hi, good evening, uh, distinguished panelists. Firstly, thank you for sharing. Uh, my name is Hong Yu, I'm a year three student. I'm very interested in becoming a trader. And I have two questions. Firstly, out of all the commodities product, why did you choose rubber? Because uh, this is not something that's very publicized in school at least. Uh, and secondly, um, in a trading firm, you say you look at the rubber futures, but from my understanding, it's are you more of a physical trader or a paper trader, or you do a mix of both? Um, with and any, anyone can, can answer the question. Maybe we go down the, um, the line here. Okay. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> to, uh, to answer you. 
40 years ago, I was in uh, SO. SO, you know, the, the petroleum company. And um, after 10 years, they put me to be a bulk oil trader. So one of the things that struck me was oil is such a big ocean. So if you want to prosper, you know, you, you, you always be a small fish. So I decided that, oh, I want to look for something where it is a small pond and I can be a big fish in a small pond. So one of the, one of the driving forces could be your inclination as to be, you want to be a, a big fish in a small pond or, or, or not. Uh, of course, the other thing is, once I get into rubber, I got stuck into it for 40 years. Um, of course, uh, I move around companies. Uh, I move from being a broker to be a rubber packer to be uh, uh, working for, for Michelin, uh, a buyer of uh, rubber. And then now, for the last 20 years, I am in a rubber processing company looking after uh, factories. I started to learn about factory production five years ago when I was uh, 65 years old. I started to learn because all, all my life I was in trading and when my company put me to look after factories, I have to start learning <laughs> productivity, uh, lean manufacturing and uh, many, many things. So you can see that in rubber, you, would not, you cannot plan for yourself as to where you finally want to be. Uh, I wanted to be a trader, but my boss says, I think you are better in, in finance, you are better in, in uh, merger and acquisition, and he sent me acquiring factories and so on. So, uh, trader is not the end all and be all of, of, of a career in the, in the, in the industry. I, I, I can say that. Maybe the others want to share some views. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, first of all, you know, while we are all here from the rubber industry, uh, basically we are in the commodity, in the commodity industry. So it's applicable for most commodities, whatever we do, whatever we are saying. Uh, I think everyone has their own reasons for wanting to be a trader. But personally, I believe that motivation to be a trader, the stronger the reason, the more determined and more effective you will be. In, in my case, uh, well, it's a long story. To, to make it short, I, uh, when I left the university, you know, those days you feel like you want to work for the poor. You know, you want to be like a socialist. So at that point of time, I came across a gentleman who, who I talked to. And from him, I understood, and from the visits that he took me around, that the smallholders, the farmers who produce rubber, they are the most poor, of, poor, poor people in the society. And those days, they were all mostly exploited, exploited by the middlemen and various level of dealers. So that kind of uh, made my life go that I could do something for the poor people. And therefore, I joined. So my motivation for the industry was very strong. And from day one, I'm very excited about what I do. And as I said, I don't work. I've been more than 40 years, and uh, I'm finding new energy because I still haven't achieved my, my goal, you know. <laughs> it's, it's still out there. So that, that's uh, motivation personally for me, but I think for different people, the, the motivation is different. But what's important for all of you is, I mean, uh, Mr. Lim started by talking about all the billionaires and the millionaires. Making money should not be your first motivation to enter the industry because it's very, very difficult. You have to go through a lot to become a trader. Actually, you've got to downgrade yourself because you've got to go back and learn basic things. You'll be put into the operation unit to see how the guy is handling the shipping, 
You'll be put through the documents, do all the clerical work, you'll be put under the statistics, do all the mundane work, you'll be put through a whole range of things before you have a platform to be a trader. Often when we leave university, it's, you know, we always want, especially the millennials, huh? they want a, a cushy uh, a, a job which they can straight away perform. They want to do it instantly and be successful. But in trading, that's not possible. So you need to have the right frame to come and invest in yourself, to learn again a lot of basic things, to have the foundation, the stronger your foundation, the more successful you'll be in trading. I think uh, that, 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 that's, that's, that's the thing. The other question you asked about was whether we are physical traders or futures traders. In the case of my company, we are the biggest pure rubber traders in the world. But we are physical traders. That means we buy and sell physical rubber. We originate from 12 countries and we sell to 80 over countries. But when we do physical, because we don't own the trees or the rubber, we have to participate in the futures market to do the hedging, to do the risk management. But our primary motivation is physical rubber trading. But we cannot get away from the futures. So I hope that answered your question. Um, yeah, just to add on, actually, I think... Um most of the trading company in Singapore are physical based. So we really deliver the rubber, the cargoes to all the major tire makers like Goodyear, Michelin, all the big tire makers you, you find in the world. So um, why we mentioned about future market? Future market is as what Mr. Da say, we use it to hedge, to, to, um, to do the risk management because most of the time we always have to create market when for the consumer, uh, for, for the producer or the consumer, it means that if the factory across the world they want to sell to you, uh, or the buyers want to buy, you must create the market you have to be in and to, to, to give in to them, you, you need to the price, but where do we hedge it? So we have to hedge it depending on the view uh, on the future market. So th that's how it goes, because to give you a very typical um, example of it, like I've been in this line for 18 years. 18 years ago, I asked my senior, uh, why, do we need, why do they need a trading company? Because like Goodyear, he's been here for like 101 years and like the factories, he, he built up very good network with the rest of, very good repo with the factories. So my seniors tell me where we stand is this way. For example, if Goodyear, want to buy a certain kind um, of quantity or in a certain month which the factory would not be able to support, we go in to do the work. So usually, for example, let's say if the tire company want to buy, let's say now we are standing in March, usually they want to buy May position, which is two months. It's very normal for factory to sell one, two months of their production, right? Um, usually they will buy from the factory, but if would you want to buy something, a position very far, like say OD, October, November, December, most of the factory were not able to do it. This is where trading company like us come in to do the trade. And we hedge the position in future market. All right, uh, thank you. Do you want to say anything? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so um, we make our money by selling consumers' tires, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't make our money by hedging commodities or, 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 or taking uh, long and short positions, right? That's, that's, we're not a trading house, we're not a uh, financial institution, right? So what we do is, is just like uh, you know, the, the team here is saying, is our, we're, we're purely physical, right? And um, we might take a little bit of a, a market view and, and buy a little bit more now or a little bit less now, uh, but essentially, um, you know, Goodyear and, and the other tire makers essentially view the world as we, our business is selling you know, high end and, and quality tires not being financial players in the market, right? So we leave, we leave that information and that, and that stuff to the, to, to the trading houses where that's their expertise 
and uh, I'll stick to making uh, making tires and, and making money on on the on the end on the end product. That's one question. Are we applying technology yeah. in, the, in, the, in the industry? I mean, um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily artificial intelligence, right? But from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the buying side, um, I have no shortage of people trying to sell me on an online platform um, or an app where I can uh, where I can buy the rubber that I need, right? So, uh, um, so you know, that's one of the probably the biggest uh, the biggest uh, growth areas right now is how are we using technology you know, to move you know, from a, a past year. We still, I say we, st we still do, what, 95% of our trades on WhatsApp and, uh, and, and, and the phone, right? I mean, that's, that's still how we, we do a lot of our business. Um, but I think uh, within the next two weeks alone, I have two people pitching you know, to Goodyear, uh, online trading platforms uh, where we can start to use an app or we can start to use uh, you know, online, uh, online tools for that. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure the traders maybe can give some more information about artificial intelligence and how they're using that for their positions and, and such, but uh, I do see technology uh, in, in my, uh, my last couple of years here in Singapore definitely taking a, uh, a much bigger chunk of the, uh, the, the, the market uh, activity going on. I think to answer that question, right, I think rubber industry is really very unique industry because even it's 100 years old, and it's a very mature industry, but it's a very niche industry. Usually, I, I got this feeling that you have to build a very good rapport to, with your customer, and a trust that you can deliver the cargo nicely, you know, just in time and no hiccups, for, to able to do the business. It's not just the price. For example, like say, uh, Mr. Das and me selling to Jeff, right? Same price, but maybe he will prefer one of us over another because the trust or whatever that we build. No, seriously. Okay? So for AI to come in, yes, I, I understand. One, right? Yeah, yeah he, will not, he will not say which one, okay? But for AI to come in is quite challenging because of this, this trust and this rapport because the rubber industry is just so unique as Mr. Leong said that like, you know, the RTAS is made off of the, what, the billionaire club or something like that. Like most people, it's true, most of the Traders are, like we have the, I think the oldest one, 85 years old. On the average, most of them are like 55 and above. So uh, I think it's only recently, the last five years, we use a lot of WhatsApp. Last time when I just joined, it's a lot calling on the phone. Even now, so sometimes you still do calling. So for AI to come in, yes, it will come, it will evolve, but I don't think so fast. I'd like to add a little <coughs> uh, insight. At our factory level, we, we try to go uh, automation as much as possible uh, to the extent of uh, using robotics in uh, one or two of our factories. But in the rubber factories, it's still pretty um, low tech, not, not too high tech. But in the distribution level, at the distribution level, you know today, blockchain is such a, such a prevailing uh, concept and is top of the town. So for distribution, we can imagine, if you know Excel, if we can, if we can transfer an Excel file from, from uh, place to place, and then if we can uh, have our um, BLs or our transaction between parties being tran uh, uh, transported around the world through the Excel file, which is almost like uh, the concept of blockchain uh, technology. That is something that will be exciting for distributors. So uh, one of the things that we will not be losing our mind, uh, uh, losing sight of is uh, this blockchain technology where you have got a lot of uh, retailers and a lot of businesses are venturing into. And so probably that's something that the uh, rubber traders in Singapore could be uh, looking into as it becomes more and more prevalent.
Sure. Can you hear me from here? Yes, yes, very clearly. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wei Long. Uh, I'm a year four student. So I'm asking this question partly from an environmental standpoint, but also maybe from an economic standpoint. Uh. So uh, from what I understand, half the world's rubber is used to make tires. Then, uh, as Mr. Leong was sharing, 11.4 uh, million tons of rubber are produced every year. So this five plus million tons of rubber, right, at least in Singapore, I think Jeff, uh, yeah, you, you might want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, if you can invent this, you will be the next billionaire club. Uh, uh, it, it's, um, so a, a couple of things. It, it's a difficult proposition, right? Because a tire, um, it, it's not just rubber, yeah? So within the, within the, the, the structure of the tire is steel and fabric, uh, Things like uh, carbon black, which is essentially coal tar, uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, rubber chemicals that help the tire uh, um, you know keep its uh, keep its shape, keep its strength, and everything. Um, so we, we certainly do have recycling programs uh, within the tire industry. Uh, one of the biggest things that we do um, is in retread, right? So when you see a truck tire or when you land on an SQ plane uh, here at Changi Airport. Uh, those tires are retreaded, right? So um, the rubber is on the, the tread compound is around the outside of the tire. As that wears down, uh, that comes to a shop, and we just put a new rubber tread around that. And we can essentially use that tire uh, three, four times. Um, the casing of the tire, right? And just putting new new tread. The tread is what grips the road and what gives you the tire's handling properties. Um, so that, that's one of our biggest recycling, uh, you know, avenues and opportunities. And I'd say the biggest growth pattern um, from a sustainability and a, and a, and a growth standpoint is uh, the next maybe leap for the industry is figuring out how do we retread a consumer tire, right? So today, consumer tires are not retreaded at all. Um, I might be wrong when I say at all. There, someone will prove me wrong. But on the whole, uh, consumer tires are not retreaded in the major markets of the world. Um, some of that is consumers don't necessarily trust the technology. Uh, you know, why would I retread a tire when I got my children in the back and it's rainy and it's wet? You know, a lot of a lot of consumer you know, angst to, uh, to 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 try to get over. But that's probably the next biggest you know leap um, in the in the industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of other sustainability you know items that are going on, right? I mean, within our industry, uh, it's probably the hottest topic uh, today. Is figuring out how do we uh, how do we all work as an industry together to to accomplish you know things like ending deforestation you know for rubber trees, uh, ensuring that the labor that takes care of the rubber uh, you know Doss was talking about is uh, is is adequately uh, compensated and, and has good livelihood. You know, so a lot of the things on, on that side of your question, sustainability, uh, the industry is it's it's probably the the thing we're all working on together to come up with a way to uh, to enhance that globally. But uh, I'd say the the biggest the biggest recycling thing you can probably touch and feel today is um, I haven't seen it in Singapore yet. But uh, we we take old tires and we re, uh, we cut them up and then uh, we we take out where the where the where the um, where the steel part is. But we put it on children's playgrounds. Um, so when you know, the kids fall on the play playground, it's, it's a rubber. Um, and then we use it for sports fields. Um, I, I haven't seen this also in Singapore. You don't quite play sports here like we do in America. Um, but, the, but the sports fields in America, uh, we take rubber pellets. And uh, that's what uh, sits underneath the, uh, the artificial grass. And it keeps the field soft uh, for the athletes uh, on, their, on their joints and on their, when they get tackled uh, in a rugby match or an American football match. So, those are some of the things that, that we do recycle tires for, but uh, it's, it's not quite enough, right? There's tons of tire waste that goes into landfills today still um, that the industry would love to uh, come up with. So when you invent it, you let me know, and uh, I, will, I will be your first funding backer, okay? Thank you very much. You know, besides uh, reusing all parts of the old tire, used tire, 
and uh, recycling some of it. There's also now new technology. I mean, it's not new. There is existing technology which can bring back the vulcanized rubber to uh, original form of, of rubber. But it's a high cost uh, uh, effort, but the technology is there. So in, in that sense, rubber uh, tires, all these are uh, sustainable products, which can be recycled, recovered to its original form. We can always uh, have these trees for us, right? It's not like uh, some other industrial commodities where you use it, it's over, right? So th that's probably the, one of my favorite things about working in sustainability and rubber is it does come from an agricultural product that lasts 25, 30 years. And uh, it, you know, while it definitely has some effect on the environment when we get to planting too much of it, uh, but there's a healthy balance within rubber where if we have the right plantings, it's, it's not a detriment to the uh, to the environment. So we are conscious of the time. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Nope. Oh, okay, sorry. I hate to hog these questions, but I, I, I have five engineers on staff, um, and most of my competitors equally have that many uh, engineers on staff, right? So uh, every single day, um, I have my engineers out at, uh, at, at the factories that the traders either work with or the producers uh, own, and uh, we're doing audits of those factories. Uh, we're working continuous improvement with those factories. Um, so it's a, it's a huge part of what we do at, uh, at Goodyear and the other tire manufacturers as well to, uh, to hire engineers uh, who are interested in the rubber, the rubber industry. Um, so I, I don't know if, if there's an, an engineering roles available. I mean, obviously with Tim, there's, there's way, way, way more than me. Uh, I've only got five, but I'm sure he's got about 500. Each of our factory, we have got electrical engineers, we have got mechanical engineers, and uh, uh, chemists and uh, so on. So, um, in Singapore, we don't have factory, but if you join us, we'll be sending you around the world <laughs> to help us in our productivity. But just, you know, now, nowadays the uh, engineering field is not like in the past, you know, if you are studying civil engineering or mechanical or electrical, you're just stuck to that. Now I think it's more broad-based, multi-discipline uh, also, right? So from that point of view, yes, even engineers can make good traders. It, it, it depends on your interest. Because if you look at an engineer, engineer is basically at, core, at the core, they're very disciplined, they're very methodical, you know, they have a good process thinking. All these are good qualities for even being a good trader, you know? So I, I, I think that you are not restricted. But of course, if you're looking from the machine point of view, yes, in the factories you have. Uh, you also have, uh, uh, in terms of uh, new discoveries for productivity improvement, quality improvements, uh, new types of uh, rubber. So th th there are many possibilities. So, so I suppose on that note, let me just close this session by saying that uh, the industry is in need of people with good attitude, good aptitude. All right? Don't let uh, your uh, field of uh, or your discipline of study constrain um, uh, your 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 view as to whether or not um, this industry is suitable for you. I suppose we, we they welcome people from all disciplines. All right. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, uh, thank you panelists for the interesting sharing session. I'm sure you guys have some more burning questions, but we can save it for the, during the networking dinner outside. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause uh, for the sharing. Uh, so before we end today's session, uh, we have some closing remarks. First, I'd like to invite um, Tian Feng from R IRSG to give a short closing remark. Uh, may I invite the panelists uh, to your seats and uh, Tian Feng to the rostrum, please. First of all, I would like to express uh, a sincere appreciation to uh, NTU and also uh, IE Singapore for inviting IRSG to tonight's event. And uh, I would like also to thank the panelists for very insightful <coughs> discussion just now. I personally have learned a lot <coughs> from our discussion and I believe you have a lot of information to process as well. So I will try to keep the closing remark as short as possible. Yeah. And uh, I will start with a brief introduction of, uh, uh, the, uh, of International Rubber Study Group. Uh, we are an uh, intergovernmental commodity organization uh, for the global rubber industry, as I mentioned just now. And uh, we were established in 1944 uh, during the World War II. And uh, uh, initially, we are uh, headquartered in London, UK. And uh, in July 2008, uh, the study group has been relocated to Singapore since at that time Singapore has already grown into the uh, trading hub for the global rubber industry. So IRG is uh, the forum uh, for discussion of matters affecting the supply and demand for natural as well as synthetic rubber. I know we've been talking about natural rubber uh, for the whole evening but, as, but the study group also studied the synthetic rubber as well. Uh, we are uh, currently we have 36 member countries and we hold uh, uh, member countries meetings once uh, in half a year and uh, in order to uh, facilitate the interaction between the study group and the industrial members uh, a panel of industry uh, a panel of industrial member has been established uh, in the study group so currently we have about more than 100 uh, industrial members uh, in fact, most of the panelists are coming from the companies who are our industry members. So, uh, we, one of our main objectives for the study group is to provide an uh, unbiased international uh, platform for uh, market participants to discuss the matters relating to the industry. So, by market participants, uh, here are some of the examples. So, you have the producers, uh, the, the natural rubber producers from Southeast Asia countries, uh, the synthetic rubber producers all over the world, and uh, you have the consumers like uh, Goodyear, Tire Majors, and also other rubber, rubber goods producers like the glove manufacturers. And you have, uh, we have uh, government officials, policy makers, and also associations uh, like RTAS, uh, and uh, processors, traders like Awan, Wilson Global, uh, Thousand, and also we have, uh, we try to include uh, universities like NTU and NUS. And last but not least, we also have members from uh, financial institutions like SGX. So uh, we try to um, provide, uh, promote market transparency by our uh, data. So we uh, we are trying our best to provide reliable uh, rubber data and accurate forecasts for the industry members. Uh, this is what ISG is trying our best to do. We all know that inconsistent data can lead 
the lead the market lead the market participants to misread the supply uh, demand fundamentals and thus make ill-informed decisions. So by providing um, accurate, comprehensive and timely data to our members, we hope to uh, help to moderate the unwanted price volatility uh, and promote informed in investment decisions and also uh, ultimately stabilize uh, the rubber markets. And these are the uh, research areas that the study groups uh, that the, the, the study group covers. So in the middle we have uh, in the middle is our core outcome of our uh, research is the uh, uh, fundamentals for both natural rubber and the synthetic rubber uh, industry. So we have demand, supply, trade, and stock levels. Then our database uh, split into five subcategories. So on the left hand, hand side, you have the natural rubber aspect, which we uh, keep track on the planting areas, uh, planting policies in different producing countries, uh, the yields of the rubber trees, and also the weather and climate change in different uh, regions, because that's going to affect the seasonal uh, supply of natural rubber. And on the top right hand side, we have the uh, synthetic rubber uh, aspect of the data, which uh, because you know uh, synthetic rubber is a petrochemical product, it's not an agricultural product. So uh, they are produced in uh, uh, crackers. So we keep track on the synthetic rubber capacities for major producers all over the world, and also their cost of production and their plant maintenance schedule, because that's also going to uh, make uh, changes to the seasonal supply. And also we track the uh, upstream market for synthetic rubber, which is the butadiene market. Uh, then the third subcategory is the downstream market. So because 70% of the rubber is consumed by the tire industry, so we take a close look at the tire and automotive industry, uh, which include the production and sales for different types of tire and vehicles and also the operational rate of their tire plants and uh, their future capacity uh, expansion plans so we could have a better gouge on the uh, future demand for, supply, uh, for, for rubber. And also we look at the other aspect of uh, the rubber trading which include uh, trade tariff between different countries uh, government interventions by the producing countries on production and export. And also we keep track on the mergers and, and acquisitions uh, in the industry because that's going to uh, change the market dynamics. And also we uh, keep track on technological advancement in both rubber and tire industry. And last but not least, uh, we also take a look at the uh, global macroeconomic trends because uh, the GDP growth is the main uh, driver for consumption in tire and automotive industry. And also we track the uh, currency markets because you know uh, natural rubber is mainly produced in Southeast Asia region and uh, African countries, but it's mainly uh, traded in the US dollars. Uh, so the, the foreign exchange uh, uh, relation between these countries' currency and the US dollar is going to affect uh, that particular country's uh, rubber price as well. So after go through what my uh, what IRC is and what uh, the what we do, I would like to share with you some of my uh, personal experience in the industry. Uh, I've uh, because I'm the most junior person here and I only left school five years ago. So maybe I think my experience is more relevant to uh, where you are now. So I studied uh, finance in, in US business school and I graduated in 2013. And after that, I joined one of the biggest uh, Chinese rubber trading companies in Singapore. And uh, I, well, I, the start of the job wasn't really what I've imagined it to be because uh, I started with uh, drafting well, uh, rubber, physical rubber contracts, uh, well, asking offers and bids from other traders and uh, placing trades for the senior traders on the platform 
and also uh, work on the position, the portfolio position reports every night after the market close. It sounds boring, but it helps. It helped me to really understand the nuts and bolts of the rubber trading business. And only after that, I was able to uh, start analyzing the market, uh, generating trade ideas, uh, trade rubber with uh, traders and uh, consumers. And then finally, uh, be able to manage part of the uh, uh, portfolio of the company. And then to, uh, Two years ago, I was uh, very fortunate to have the opportunity to join IRC. And uh, working as a rubber economist is quite different compared to that of uh, a rubber trader. I no longer try to beat the market, but I need to beat the deadlines. Uh, so I was uh, mainly responsible for drafting uh, the study group's statistical reports and also uh, assisting in uh, updating and designing the uh, rubber forecasting models. So I, get, I also get the chance to uh, speak to different groups of uh, stakeholders in the rubber value chain and also being assigned to different well, special projects uh, related to the industry. I would say it's a, more, it's a very good exposure for me uh, because I get to know uh, many more people and many get more knowledge about the industry. So I'm very grateful for my five years in the rubber industry. Uh, but, there's always a but, uh, if I would be able to going back to uh, the past, I would, I, 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 I will have some advice for the old me. Uh, the first one is, advise myself to read a few books on commodity trading during school holidays. Uh, I know you guys are very busy with CCAs and the internships, but if you do really want to uh, join the trading industry, you, uh, it's better for you to read a few books. I've made a list for myself. Uh, the first one is called The Commodity Demystified. It's actually not a book. It's an 80 pages long uh, report written by a group of traders from uh, Trafigra. Uh, Trafigra is one of the world's biggest uh, commodity trading companies. Uh, the reports mainly focus on uh, oil, petrochemical products, uh, metals, and the minerals, because that's where the companies may uh, knowledge in. But it also covers other commodities like uh, agricultural products as well. So it gives you the uh, fundamentals of the physical side of commodity trading. And uh, I personally benefit quite a lot from it. Uh, the second book is called Trading Commodities and Financial Futures. Uh, I think the name is quite self-explanatory. Uh, it gives you a rough explanation on what financial, uh, on what <coughs> futures is, and also lists down a few strategies that you could apply uh, for commodity trading. The last book is called Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets, uh, written by John Murphy. Uh, this is so-called the Bible of the technical analysis traders. I know uh, we've said a lot about fundamentals. We made decision, uh, investment decision based on fundamentals, but uh, sometimes you could re use the uh, technical analysis for market timing. And also, I think there's no harm uh, in knowing what the other side of the table is thinking, right? So these are the three books I... Uh, written down for my old self. Then the second <coughs> advice is uh, start trading early. If you do really want to be a trader, even with a very small account of a few thousand dollars, or even a demo account, because that is going to give you the experience and knowledge you needed for your first job. And, um, and, you, will be, and you will learn how to take on risk because that's the thing you have to deal with every day if you are a trader. Uh, don't, afraid, don't, don't be afraid of uh, losing money because uh, it just make sure that you learn something out of your mistakes. But one thing I want to say is that please do not trade uh, bitcoins, uh, bitcoins and ripples, or these things. You can try equities, uh, currencies, or that, but not bitcoins. 
Uh, the third advice uh, I will give the old me is to keep fit and maintain a healthy lifestyle because the trading job is, could be a very stressful one. So you will need a very strong body and the mentality to really outperform in the industry. Then one additional point is if the older me is, was not a business student, I would recommend him to take a business minor or take the uh, CFA exam uh, because that's going to uh, give you help you set the foundation of understand how the financial markets and how the, uh, uh, the business world works. Yep. And last but not least, I would recommend you to, if you really want to be a commodity trader, I would recommend you to keep trying and uh, don't be afraid of uh, fails, failures. So I will end my uh, closing remark with the quotes from one of my idols. Uh, <coughs> He's uh, one of the most successful hedge fund managers in the world, uh, the CEO of uh, Water, Bridgewater, uh, Ray Dalio. Uh, it, he, he said in his uh, book, Principles, if you are not failing, you are not pushing your limits. And if you are not pushing your limits, you are not maximizing your potentials. So with that, I end my presentation and thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Tian Fong. Uh, let's, uh, lastly, right, we have a short uh, closing remark uh, by Ms. Vivian Xia. Um, she's from IE Singapore, and yeah, let's invite her to give the closing remark now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to do a quick one. I'm supposed to do an opening, but then I got stuck in the traffic. So, um, thank you, my panelists. Um, thank you for taking time for um, being here today. And I think our objective as a government agency is very simple to increase the awareness of the commodity trading sectors in Singapore as one of the career options for all of you guys. So I'm not sure how much you know about IE Singapore. So International Enterprise Singapore is a government agency under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So we are the lead agency in Singapore that is responsible of growing Singapore's commodity trading. Um, very less to, to uh, it's, it's not so well known to, to the public in Singapore. Singapore is actually the second largest agri commodity hub in the world. We are second to Geneva. So, IE Singapore has been the force in driving Singapore to develop as a commodity hub in the world. So, for myself, I look after the agri commodities team in IE Singapore together with my colleague Ming Hao. So he is in charge of the rubber sectors, growing the rubber trading in Singapore. Um, we work with NTU, we work with SMU to, to create a lot of programs that hopefully will interest you guys in joining the commodity trading sectors. Uh, today, the commodity trading sectors contribute about 4% of our GDP. And today, we have close to 400 commodity trading companies spanned across energy and chemicals, metals and minerals, and agri-commodities that located in Singapore. And we created more than 15,000 jobs in Singapore. So commodity trading is all about maximizing optionalities. And that's the importance of Singapore as a commodity trading hub. Um, rubber sectors. So back to rubber sectors. Seven years ago, I get to know, I, I, I took over the, the, the rubber sectors as one of my, my, my jobs in IE Singapore. Um, thanks to Sandana Das. He's one of the veterans that taught me about rubber trading. I'm not a trader, but through he and a lot of these rubber veterans, I get to know and IE Singapore get to know what do we need to do to improve Singapore's uh, value positions as a commodity trading hub? So we work with industry players very closely. We also work with institutions like the university very closely to create opportunities for, for you guys, the, the futures of Singapore. So I will not delay so much. I know everybody have to go home. So if you are interested in the commodity trading sectors, speak to our rubber companies here, speak to our panelists here, or if you wish to find out more about commodity trading, you can speak to CIT and of course IE Singapore.
All right, thank you so much for attending this session. Okay, with that, uh, we have come to the end of today's session. I uh, hope that you found the session today meaningful. So after this, there will be a networking session outside uh, so that you can interact with the industry professionals. professionals. Also joining us at the networking session will be more rubber company representatives such as Goodyear, Grand Focus, Lee Rubber, Michelin, and Southland Singapore. Um, so don't forget to return your, your feedback forms to the registration counter outside, okay? Mm -hmm.